Greetings again, and we're going to do another case. Um, I'm wearing a hat because I haven't been able to get a haircut of late because of this uh, COVID-19 business. So uh, rather than let my wife cut my hair, I'm wearing a hat, uh, even though my head's just about bald. Uh, we're going to get into New Jersey, New York, and some Delaware River decoys, which um, again, they all have really interesting places that they come from, different waves, different ways to carve things, um, and different outlooks on stuff. And it's pretty much how, um, in this area, uh, where decoy collecting began with, with uh, Joel Barber. Uh, we have one of his birds here in the case, um, which is a, a bluebill. And uh, Joel took a lot of different styles of birds that he collected um, from the turn of the century on. Um, and, and added it to this, uh, this bluebill that he did, which is a really aesthetically pleasing for a bluebill decoy, being that it's uh, nice and shaped, it's nice and round, um, it's got a beautiful head on it. Uh, the only thing he didn't do was paint it. Uh, it's been uh, steel, sealed and stained, um, but um, you know, there it is. It's, uh, it is what it is, and he is the, doctor, the, uh, the father of decoy collecting that we uh, recognize uh, in the United States. Um, he's in with this case because that's where he started. Um, we have a curlew in here, which is interesting considering that it's a uh, running curlew, but if you'll notice on the back, there are staples and there's also wing bones. Uh, what they did was they took the wings off of a bird that they had shot and uh, stapled the wings on it so that they could use uh, uh, the wings as part of their paint job, if you would. Um, and, uh, well, what you're seeing is what's left of it. Uh, and uh, the bill, of course, is probably a piece of oak that's splined through the head, um, and the, uh, the head itself is splined into the body. So uh, it put together so that if it broke, we could, uh, we could fix it and change it. Interesting bird. And coupled with, um, we run into New Jersey's. Um, here's a Tom Fitzpatrick from uh, Delanco, uh, New Jersey. Now this is, wasn't used in the shores of New Jersey. This was used in the Delaware River. Um, of course, the Delaware River separates Pennsylvania from New Jersey. And you can tell definitely, definitely uh, New Jersey uh, influence on those from Delaware, being that the, the primaries are carved on the back. Um, and they're uh, undercut a little bit in front of them. Some of them have a little gap uh, underneath the primary to allow water to drain out so that it would not be in there and freeze. Uh, but a lot of them have that raised primary look. Um, and uh, they were very hollow, very light. Uh, and they were uh, being able to, you know, put them in your, in your uh, push boat and push down the river and uh, rig out that way. Uh, it was interesting to, uh, to, to see them, we run into uh, various different ideas when you do that. We run into Long Island birds then, um, like here's one from Amityville, Long Island, a red-breasted merganser. Um, and why anybody would want to shoot them and eat them, I don't know. I've tried them one time and that was enough for me. And that was on a dare down in Shinkatig. And uh, I don't have that guy anymore. <laughs> they, uh, they're interesting, but um, they used to uh, um, used to hunt them just uh, you know for food. Okay, we have a uh, Harry Shorts uh, from Tuckerton, New Jersey, um, a scalp drake. You can see the small size. Um, they used dimension lumber. Most of it uh, was white cedar um, that came you know from the boat building industry. Uh, they used a lot of two inch stock. So they are able to make a four inch or three inch decoy with no problems whatsoever. Um, two pieces put together, um, then they would uh, hollow them, take them apart, hollow them, uh, put them back together with white lead and nails um, and uh, paint them. And a lot of times they were stippled on the back to uh, refract light uh, so that they wouldn't shine in the water. Uh, nice small decoys like that, um, they could carry uh, more of them in the back of their Barnegat. Um, even though Harry V never gunned a lot, um, he was busy making decoys. Um, so the other people could hunt with him, uh, which is uh, 
probably what he really wanted to do. He wanted to make money and uh, make decoys and, and paint houses. So that was good for him. But uh, you run into other birds from, uh, from that same general area, you know, from Long Island Sound, you know, uh, and they're made of cork. And where that cork came from was old life, bass, uh, life vests, uh, life jackets that would wash ashore. Um, these guys would scavenge them and uh, make decoys out of them. You find a lot of natural cork uh, decoys that were made up there. Um, you know, single size like that pintail, or you would find bigger ones that they would spline the two halves together um, and put them, uh, make them a little bit thicker. But uh, it's uh, one of the areas where they actually used a lot of natural cork, and it was because it was a found material, um, which was neat. And one that really does need to be talked about too is this black duck. It's attributed to uh, uh, Joel Barber also, so it makes it a, uh, a nice old bird in our collection, in the collection, I should say. Um, and uh, Joel Barber being, you know, the doctor of duckology, if you will, and, uh, precursor to this whole thing. Um, one I think is really interesting, the old Viking himself, Harold Treggs, um, this black duck. You see a lot of his, they're really stylish the way he built them. It's mostly because of the underside. It's not so much the top. Um, that's a black duck, and it's hard to find black ducks. You find a lot more mergansers, uh, squaws, uh, you know, birds of that nature. You can see that it was rigged fore and aft, so we could uh, run it on a trawl. Um, he would uh, put two birds or, you know, a number of birds on the same line. Uh, but it was ground cork on top. Uh, he would glue that on and then paint over top of it. Um, and take up the, uh, um, the shine, if you would, uh, on that whole thing. It, uh, uh, light wouldn't refract off of that, so that would be uh, um, a, a great thing to, uh, to be able to see. But I've never really seen many black ducks. I've seen more of, uh, of the uh, uh, mergansers and the uh, old squaws. Um, and we were talking about Joel Barber earlier. Here is a finished uh, skull that he did which is a really neat bird. He, he thought a lot about decoys, being he was an architect, and he would uh, draw the patterns and uh, make them really, I guess you could say pop in everybody's minds, being that uh, we could see them in 3D by his patterns. It was it's kind of like a, uh, an architectural uh, drawing, without a doubt, that he would do something. Um, so it, uh, and then, you know, you can see in you know, his simple stylistic paint, um, there isn't anything that isn't uh, um, taking advantage of the lines and everything. He was doing pretty much straight on. Uh, lines were fairly straight and just lightly curved, slightly curved rather. Um, it wasn't anything that was really uh, outstanding. Um, but it really mattered. It really uh, uh, matches the bird itself. One of my favorites, and something that I collect a lot of, is uh, wildfowler decoys. Uh, we have a pair of them here in the case. There's the black duck. Um, this is uh, from Quogue. Uh, wildfowler started out at three different places. One was uh, uh, Point Pleasant, New Jersey. The other one is Old Saybrook, Connecticut, is where they started. Um, the, uh, some of the best birds that I've ever seen have come out of uh, um, Connecticut. Uh, some of my favorites have been there. Uh, the Quogue birds, when they sold the factory, I believe it was in 1955, they took it to Quogue, New York, um, and they switched from oil paints to acrylic paint. Um, and uh, they didn't have Marion Harris anymore as the lead painter. Uh, she stayed behind and her, her husband Richard started uh, uh, Harris decoys in uh, um, Old Saybrook. Um, whereas, uh, forget the fellow's name offhand, I'd have to go home and look it up, but he had uh, uh, all of uh, Wildfowler's bodies and heads, and a lot of them were stamped, uh, you know, uh, uh, Old Saybrook, and, uh, you know, he put them together in Quogue, but uh, painted them in, uh, in uh, with, uh, with the acrylic. Um, he had a lot of folks that came in from Long Island and would help him make decoys. Uh, put these birds together and paint them up and 
he made uh, he worked out a deal with them that they could come in and uh, they would buy the bird and and uh, they could paint it put it together in his shop but uh, that was before um, they moved then sold to charlie birdsaw and moved it to uh, point pleasant new jersey uh, and charlie uh, took off and running with uh, um, point uh, point pleasant and uh, at point pleasant with uh, with the lathes and everything that he had from uh, uh, Wildfowler, Old Saybrook. Uh, they all came down from there. So uh, you'll find them from all different factories. And then they went into uh, uh, Babylon, and there was two other owners before there was an owner now out in the uh, Midwest that owns uh, Wildfowler. Um, that's the uh, first time I ever saw Wildfowler decoys was in the same book with uh, um, Ben Schmidt. Um, and it just you know, I just realized right then and there I had to collect wildfowler decoys. And uh, so I started collecting wildfowlers and uh, um, fell in love with them. And they look great in the water. I, mean, I actually hunt with some of them, hunted with some of them. Uh, hunted with uh, some brant over in Shinkatik one time with, with Russell Fish, which just about put him over the edge because I'm throwing a couple hundred dollar birds in the, in the rig and he doesn't, he, he didn't care a whole lot for that idea. But I thought it was neat. You know, you, you can't uh, have fun with these things unless you play with them. Um, so, um, and I still collect them. At, uh, you know, I've moved up a bit to, to uh, collect Ward Brothers now too. And uh, that uh, in itself is a passion for sure. So we uh, run into some other birds in here too. And most of these are from uh, um, the uh, Delaware River that you will find in here. Like, and that's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting black deck because the, you can see that the primaries are uh, separated uh, at the top. That they're, and there's also a hole that goes underneath the primaries to allow water to drain out. Um, if you can, I don't know if you can get that or not, but uh, you can see the uh, thing. That is one thing that when you're gunning, you don't want ice to build up. So you want to make sure that water can drain out of everything. Um, another one that we had here is uh, J and J West, listed as JJ West. It was a father and son who made decoys together. Um, I think it's Jim and John West, um, and they uh, they made uh, uh, ducks and they called them JJ West because they were both uh, that name. And then finally, I believe it was Jim that went out on his own um, and left his dad and started making his own decoys and. Uh, um, for uh, contemporary contests.